Um, we're very fortunate to have with us, um, I guess, on my far right, Peter Buckley. Next to him in red plaid, Sid Mead, and closest in blue, Claude Potts. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do this, but I did want to start with something quick, which they can give their feelings about. Um, and, and I don't want to, there, there have been a lot of things in the papers about what's happening to farming and the, the 12 most, um, the 12 areas in which farming is most threatened in this country, the Hudson Valley is one of them because we're near a major city. The inner city spreads out, the suburbs move, and the farmland gets taken, and uh, what this does to everyone. Um, there were, in this area in 1940, there were 18,600 um, farmers, and whereas according to the census in 1992, there were 3,335. And we have three here tonight. But what I want to read you is just something wonderful because this is harvest and Thanksgiving time and we should be thinking about the rest. This is a quote. This is the current Hudson Valley Magazine, which is featuring the harvest. And it quotes from a book by a man named Wendell Berry, who wrote The Unsettling America and the Gift of Good Land. And he wrote, the occupation of farmers is not only agriculture, but is a part of an ancient pattern of values, ideas, aspirations, attitudes, faiths, knowledges, and skills that propose and support the sound establishment of a people on the land. To defend the small farm is to defend a large part and the best part of our cultural inheritance. So um, I think you should keep that in mind. And uh, with that, um, perhaps we can start. Uh, if each of you would be willing to talk a little bit about your farms. Um, I know, I think, let's see, Peter Buckley's got back to 1735, at least the house. Yeah, I was born in <laughs> 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 Well, I, uh, years ago, back in somewhere late 40s, I met a young lady, and, uh, and we got involved in we used to get hugging, and she was, used to hug me so tight, I didn't know which side she was on. We <laughs> <laughs> carried on for a while, and I married her. So, at the same time, I evidently married the farm, <laughs> which is, uh, her grandfather had bought it in 1896, so two more years, it'll be 100 years in the, in the family. And at the time, it was a dairy farm and a fruit farm and a chicken farm all together. And my father-in-law at the time, before that, had had 5,000 chickens, which was a lot of chickens in those days. And of course, my wife, she picked an awful lot of chickens. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> I had just come back from the war, and, and my experience in, in farming had been usually on the summer in farm, but spent years uh, in Vermont uh, on a small farm. And, and then I spent summers, uh, a couple summers up in Fultonville on a farm. And uh, I went to Cornell in agriculture, and I don't know if any of you have ever read the last convertible or not. If you have, that was my education. That was kind of I had a good time. Let's put that <laughs> well, I got convertibles again now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the farm, uh, we had a few cows on, and, and uh, the fruit and I didn't agree. Uh, I used to hook up the, the old sprayer with horses and, and uh, go up on the hill and spray in the garden. What do you call it? Where do you get uh, yeah. Traces. The traces would break. Yeah. I'd have to get all the traces. And I got awful tired of spraying that way, so one day I went in the house and uh, I told my wife I'd let me buy a tractor. And so they're tired of driving this thing around, so you could drive. First thing you know, I, I left the sprayer running, the horse is sitting out there, and all of a sudden, I didn't hear the, the sprayer going anymore. 
hogy Lönnyi fogok tőle. Just a little side here. I was on the school board once at Albany one time. We had a meeting of all the big wheels there. And, and I didn't know who this guy was over here. And uh, I knew he was all dolled up. And everybody had his arm over him. And, uh, and I said, well, what, what was the matter with you? Oh, he said, I was messing around with my man saw. And he said, well, I've got an arm. And I said, well, any day a fool could do that. <laughs> and every, everybody kind of. That changed. Uh, he, uh, they started picking up milk from the milk trucks. So he had to get a milk tank. And so, fortunately, or unfortunately at the time, uh, we had done a favor for an elderly man. And, and he fortunately left us a little money, just enough to buy a milk tank. So we bought a milk tank. Getting up and getting down, uh, I, I, uh, I was, my knees were getting bad, and, and I'd get down, and my knees would go up, and I'd, I'd be rolling on the floor. Up and <laughs> so that's when it came time to, to get a milk parlor. So I had a milk parlor with three cows on the side where the cows came in, and I could milk them standing up, and they were up this level. And that's uh, that went on until we finished milk the cows, of course. But, and we, we had a good herd of cows as far as milking. We didn't have a fancy herd, but we had we had the best herd in Dutchess County as far as the production goes quite a few years. And Bob Gregg would have it one year, and we would have it the next year, and so forth. But the changes in, in uh, farming, uh, we used to have to cultivate our corn, with a, a two horse cultivator. And uh, along came all the, uh, the sprays, nitrogen, and so forth. And the wheat killers, and no more cultivating corn, which uh, caused all this business of, uh, well, it, it enabled farmers to continuously grow corn and so forth on the same piece of ground year after year, which is one of the worst things a farmer can do, uh, but it's the only way it can be done anymore. And, and it's a you always you always had corn one year and uh, you'd have oats the next year and seed it down and then you'd have hay a couple years and you'd keep turning the, the ground over and then you'd be putting something back in the soil all the time. Now all they put in the soil is is fertilizer. These people are tired they grow uh, what do you call this this vegetable because there's nothing in it. Organic. Organic, organic vegetable. Uh, you better question it a little bit. And, uh, and we uh, we 
we always had a, a we had street boys on the farm. Kingston Bridge. That's that was the toward the end of the farm as far as I can see. But some of that happened a couple of years you needed a school. And, and a few more years you needed another school and it won't be long for me to need another one probably. But uh, that's when urbanization started, taxes started <coughs> going up, and farmers are now farming real estate. They aren't farming paying real estate taxes. And, and it can't be done anymore. It's, uh, that's why there are not any farmers anymore. Well, we have to compete with other areas where the taxes are a lot less. Well, that's true, too. <coughs> but it's, uh, that's one of the reasons around here that things are kind of going Did Maine, did he leave you some? Hmm? Did he leave you some? Or do you want to take issue? I'll leave, uh, no. I'll leave it there. Sit and fall? Sit there. Well, he's right. We have, we've, we've seen a lot of changes. So. <coughs> your well, farm started, I think you told me, what, 1916? Your yeah. Your grandfather, father? Father. Father. Uh, father. Uh, at present, I'm in partnership with a son. Uh, when, when I started, we, we picked apples in a metal pail. And it was for the uh, Macintosh, which was a new variety. Uh, prior to that, uh, either they picked it in a bag that hung on their shoulder, uh, or a uh, basket, which, uh, what do you call it? It's just a regular uh, old-fashioned basket with a wooden handle, and a tip wooden handle. And the problem was with Macintosh, uh, they couldn't dump this uh, basket without bruising the apples. So uh, we had a, a large number of pails, and the picker would bring in one or two pails, and we had several women who, who uh, they uh, put a rag over the top of the uh, pail and tip it into the small box. tried to go up two rows uh, with a truck uh, between four trees and two pickers on each tree. And so we didn't have to carry the pails very far. We carried the pails to the truck. And the women would work on, on the back of the truck dumping these pails. And it, it worked all right, except the truck was in the way to get the, usually get the ladders around the insides of tree and, <coughs> and when he, if one side got a little ahead why they they got too far to carry the pails.
do things like that. What made the Macs so good? I mean, if they were new, I always thought those well, were for the they were, uh, they were a high producer, and they uh, they gained apparently they gained popularity with the public rather quickly, which which is unusual. Usually, it takes about thirty years for a variety. To shoulder and it has a canvas bottom. It's, it's kind of flattish, a little bit body shaped. And uh, uh, you can, there are two ropes and hooks on the sides and you can lay that in the big bin, just lay it on the apples and then you open the, open the ropes and slowly pull the bucket off the apples. And it, uh, it does dump the apples so or you can dump them a lot more gently. The, uh, this drop bucket, I thought, was a, a big advantage, except you couldn't hang it on the ladder. You had to hang it on your shoulder. That's, that's kind of rough. But, what, how many varieties do you grow in? Oh, we got about 12 or 15. Do you have any success with the empires? Uh, we did have, but I'm afraid that they're on the downgrade now. Why? Well, because everybody's growing them. Okay. And the, the chain stores still haven't adopted them. <coughs> Many other markets have. They, they, their main market is export to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, was that an apple developed in this area? It was developed by uh, Cornell. What is it, a crust between a Corbin and? No, a Mac, a Mac and a Delicious. It's, it's a good apple. See, I like it better than a Mac. Yeah, I do too. I, I like it better than a Corbin. Well, <laughs> well it's, it, it, is, it is a good apple. Like, uh, How's it hold? Is it, does it hold in the, in, in the house uh, longer than the Mac? I would say so, yes. You should refrigerate any apple. I mean, they look, they look great on the table, but put them back in the refrigerator before you go to bed. <laughs> and they'll last a lot longer. They'll, they'll keep and, and stay warm. But unfortunately, the public only knows three big name names mm -hmm. uh, Macintosh, Delicious, and Roll. Well, we've been doing a, a little uh, pick your own. And it's surprising uh, how many uh, people want a certain variety, and they want it. They want to be able to pick it when they come. I mean, you could have picked it three months ago, and it doesn't matter. But they want it, <laughs> and they just don't understand why they can't have it. Is that it going into all pick your own now? Oh no. a certain amount of apples, and they sometimes damage the trees, but uh, we, uh, uh, we discourage climbing and no ladders, they're supposed to put a hole from the ground. Can you describe the advent of the tote bins and, and what were used prior to the uh, Well, uh, we, we used a, a bushel, a wooden box held about a bushel prior to that. They, they all had to be either, they were all handled by hand, although I guess at the, just before we started with the totes, uh, we palletized the small boxes on, on a pallet 
wasn't, uh, it wasn't really much faster. It, it was faster to unload the truck, but I wouldn't say it was much faster to load it up. But uh, I don't know uh, just what the uh, sequence was on the development of the uh, tow thing. Maybe you better enlighten us. It came in in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, just from a handling standpoint, and, and, and the speed of, of storage and retrieval, I think, and saved a great deal of time, made, made everything more mobile. I think the first one that got them around here was Wally Schreiber up at, uh, at what's now the uh, Hudson Processing. They, they had a, uh, a cooperative up there, and he was the one that first ordered bins, I think. I don't know whether he was instrumental in developing it or not, but I know he was the first one to order. You probably know Wally, he was a farmer out in Peelerville, a uh, grower in Peelerville. Years ago, there used to be in this area a lot of small cider mills that farmers used to, they used to utilize. Yeah, them. we used to have prohibition too. We used to have prohibition too. But then none of that's left now. It's almost a good market for cider apples during the prohibition. <laughs> so I was told. I was a little bit before my time. <laughs> I'm sure you never made any part of Oh, I wouldn't say that. Lord Potts, when you talk about hard cider? <laughs> How do you know? Uh, I'm going to start out uh, primarily from what my father and mother had told me. We have, our farm dates back about four generations. Yeah. Uh, uh, but when I, before my time, and before I could remember, uh, uh, it was primarily a sufficient type of farm. They had four or five cows, usually four horses, Two were road horses, and two were primarily wood horses. Our, uh, they and chickens and the, everything of that type. They would take make butter. Our, uh, they had a dog with a uh, treadmill that would operate the churn. Uh, the same treadmill and uh, the dog would also do the laundry. Boat would come uh, over from Softy, so you load paper on print, 
contained paper mill over there. And then uh, the boomers would go down to uh, uh, New York. Uh, this is changing I, my image of farming. <laughs> <laughs> I can say these things now. Molly, Patchy Molly, uh, he was the lead agent uh, for, for the local uh, bootleg. <laughs> well, they probably, they have a lot of horses there, too. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, that's how uh, wheat was connected with the hard side of the moon. So. And, well, also back then, our, our farm has stayed about the same size, acreage-wise. We uh, always uh, grew and packed our own food. And we still do. Our, uh, back then, they would probably pack out maybe 15, 1800 bushels of apples a year on the same acreage we're doing today. And uh, they would again uh, be shipped to New York by boat. We didn't have trucks going to New York at that time. Later on, they started to take the food down the truck. It limited uh, a lot of the uh, production area for fruits and that. It had to be close fairly to close city. to the river to... Uh, oh, yeah. to close to the city, too. Right, right. And, uh, of course, our, uh, we grew a lot of strawberries. That was a, a big early money cash crop every year. Our, uh, we didn't have all the social programs they have today. The bo uh, boys would usually would come over from Socrates to pick berries. They would come over in the morning daybreak or before daybreak. And at that time we had a little uh, ferry down at Tivoli Dock. And but it didn't run until approximately six o'clock in the morning. But these guys were very really <coughs> anxious to get over there and pick and get the the, the first rows. And they, they would fight over which row they were going to get. But they would come over by rowboat. Some mornings there were so many that they couldn't get all in the rowboat. Some of them would swim along and hang on the side of the boat. And now the water was cold because this was the first part of June. But they were anxious for point. And we were paying uh, at that time two cents, two, two cents a quart. Right. And well, they, they would get a dollar and a half, two dollars a day. They would uh, pick their hundred quarts, wasn't too many. When there. was that roughly? Um, in the 30s. In the 30s, because I picked up, and my best day was $2.40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was getting three cents. I mm -hmm. a lot more than you guys. <laughs> 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 we're not doing that. Now, uh, price-wise, uh, at the first part of, of the season, we would get 75 and 80 cents a quart for these berries. Mm -hmm. Now, toward the end, uh, the price went down, but you did have all the berries coming from California, all over the world, as they're coming now. Mm -hmm. And the early projects is what brought the money for those days. And uh, uh, the baskets were just a fraction of a cent a piece. Today, those same baskets are 10, 15 cents a piece. Uh, uh, the crates that you put the berries in, the uh, commission merchants in New York, down on Washington Street, the old market, right off the canal, uh, they would send the crates up, they were free, and you didn't have the expense that you have today on to it. And now, going over into the apple line in the production, uh, I'll start when I was a kid. I used to help my father. We didn't have motorized uh, pumps to uh, spread the apples with. We, there was a, a bow on a wagon with a hand pump. You, some of you might remember, you'd keep pumping. One would, guy would have to do that. One guy would be on the ground with a hose, with a long boom type so that you get the spray up on the top of the trees. And then that carried on with us until probably mid-30s. Then we get... When, that's how, how many sprays would you use a year then? Uh, probably two. And now how many do you use then? How many do you use uh, 15 to 18? Just one. It starts in April and ends. <laughs> <laughs> then we got a motorized sprayer. Had one of these chug chug motors on to it. And that was the thing. Actually, you could go out there and you, you were spraying with uh, three to four hundred pound pressure.
pressure and you really do the job. You thought you had uh, the, the best thing going. And that carried on for a few years. Of course, as Pete said, you had a team of horses pulling it along the line. And, that, and then the horses, they didn't like that spray when that started getting a rise. And, that. and then we went into, got, we went into track just about 1940. In fact, we got the first track that we bought was one from your, your father, your father-in-law's brother, yeah. Ed Rebbe. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he was an international deal about that. We, that was our first track that we got. And we put that on the, the same sprayer that we've been pulling with horses. And that worked out a lot better. Then, uh, well, then we went into a power takeoff sprayer. That was still hand-operated. Then in the mid fifties, late fifties, we went into the speed spray. Air blast. Air blast. Now, one man could do in an hour what two men would have to do. It would take all day to do. And that was we're still using that type of spray yet today in air blast machines. Uh, I said before this on the same acreage we used to pack out fifteen, eighteen hundred. Bushel a year. Now on the same acreage, and uh, with newer sprays, higher intensity and whatnot, we are packing out around 10 to 12,000 bushel a year. But dollar and cents wise, we're not any further ahead now than we are then. Further behind. Behind, right. Would you mind explaining what some of the sprays do uh, other than just? keep the, uh, the apple perfect. Is there something like that changes, makes it change the color, something to hold the apple on the tree or anything? Well, uh, we did have aloe, which we could use, which is uh, tended to hold them on the tree and give them more color. Unfortunately, uh, through misrepresentation, uh, aloe has been taken off the market. We're still, there still is a lawsuit against uh, uh, Let's see that word. CBS and CB, yeah. Nash, uh, mm. uh, oh, 60 minutes right now. Yeah. 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 But, uh, -E -D -E -R -C, is it? N -E -N -E -N -E -R -C. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we do no longer have that to use. Uh, we, uh, we do have our uh, methylenic acid type sprays, which can thin the apples in the spring and also can hold them on the tree uh, in the fall for a short period. Um, yeah. Not nothing as well as working as good as what Ally did. What what we have to use the most often are are uh, fungicides for uh, a host of diseases which we have in our damp climate. They're diseases that are generally caused by uh, uh, rain or wet, wet weather, and uh, we have to start the fungicides early in the spring for apple scab, and then there, there are various diseases that go for the whole season. So we have to, uh, every time we spray, we almost always include a, a fungicide with it. That's what we use the most of, really. We use more fungicides than we do insecticides. This year was especially bad for sunny block and fly spec. Because sure. we had so much damp, uh, well, in uh, July, August, and <coughs> early September. Yeah, that's something that comes in late. You think you're okay, and you go to pick, and you find you're not. <laughs> Are this is why you get. This is why you got out of fruit farming. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, well, his, his horses ran away with his spray. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I enjoyed the week. My wife and I had sold vegetables mainly because we like to talk to people. We, we had awful nice people over the years. This 
business of Claude talking about the, the dog and so forth reminds me <laughs> of, uh, I was in the Air Force during the war and I was over in Africa. And you'd be surprised uh, in the northern part of Africa, early in the spring, it's beautiful. From one side to the other, just one mass of, of uh, wheat. Well, at the air, I was at, at the air base we, where we were. Uh, there was an Arab, little Arab outfit right off the end of the runway, and uh, there were well, probably two or three families there. And when it came time to thresh the wheat, they they had cut the wheat and they piled it up in the yard. There. Well, there was a Sirocco wind. It usually comes in along about, uh, I'd say. July, late July and August. That's a hot wind. It's a hot, dry wind. And the, the, the dust in the air and so forth is terrible. But 6 o'clock in the morning, the wind would start blowing. And 6 o'clock at night, the wind would stop. And, uh, and it would be, we never slept without a blanket. It was cold. So the sun got down. But the time came for the Arabs to, to thrash the wheat. They put it out in a circle, and they had some little, uh, not donkeys, one of these burrows. They had three or four burrows, and they had them on a, on a, on a you know, a, what a you call tether. A tether, and with a, and they'd be going around a circle. And they'd walk round and round and round, and they'd thresh that weed out. Then the wind would blow, and they'd, they'd come out there with forks, and they'd throw the, the straw up in the air and it would blow it all away. And then they sweep up the, the grain. Well, after the day was done, they turned those poor old burrows out, and there they'd be, just standing there. <laughs> I don't know where they ever rested. <laughs> Yep. 
it's uncanny. I mean, it, it, they use, the limbs are there, but there's no bloom. I mean, they're just, <laughs> yeah, right. they're just they really can stand out and that point is a reach up a long way. But they don't seem to. Now, whether they're not hungry enough or whether there's not enough food value in that tiny little bud for them to stand on their hind legs or, or what, I don't know. But they, so far, in this one orchard, they've just they're about four feet. That's about it. Maybe maybe a little higher. They have a preference, too. I mean, they like some, some <laughs> buds better than others. Especially delicious. <laughs> And they like they like some apple leaves better, some right, varieties right. better than others. They and they like, like some of the spray we put on too. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at the beginning, have a salt base to it. Oh, uh huh. Mm. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> well, you have to put out salt base for it. <laughs> and unfortunately, last, not this past year, but the year before that, uh, I I got five light in uh, some of the trees where the deer had chopped the ends off and then. With the rain where they and damaged it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if you get a hailstorm during fire fire blight season, you've got fire blight, you've got to get right out there. After the hailstorm put on spray because the, the bark can, tends to be nicked by the hail. If it's sharp, you'll get fire blight. That that fire blight. Yes. It can, really, it is. I was wondering between last winter being so cold and the dry weather before and that, it really cleaned up a couple blocks of delicious on. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like the reason that was no picnic. <laughs> <laughs> but why is the Hudson Valley? The Hudson Valley's good for apples though. Yes? No? Okay. Well, it, it, it used to be. some of the best apples. <laughs> used to be. That's but because you're it, stubborn. It's not that an economical. <laughs> place to grow apples. As Sid was saying before with the fungicides, we have to use more fungicides in the valley here because of the high humidity and moisture in the air than we do up further north, Champlain Valley. Well, yeah, they've got a little cooler weather too, that, right, yeah. which uh, uh, scab is temperature related as well as moisture related. And they're growing enough of a dwarf up there. <clears throat> no. They, they have both. You do? Champlain? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm speaking of the North Way as you get up uh, near Plattsburgh. Uh, yeah, that was Champlain. Yeah. That's Champlain, isn't it? Yeah. Well, they're planting some dwarfs, but they still have a lot of the old uh, the standard trees. Yeah. The same way you have ground sodas in uh, that area. They, 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 can, they can get such good, they can get a lot better color than we can. And even on big old trees, they can get. So they can get good color. But they don't have the longest growing seeds that we do here, do they? No, but it's long enough for Max. Mm -hmm. It's Max, don't go. Yes. Don't they have uh, fences that they put up to keep the deer out of the, out of the orchards? They don't work? Well, they don't. They uh, they work somewhat. It slows them down. I have to put fences around some rich little. Uh, Non deciduous trees right up by the house, so that they chew out the lower branches so that there right. were no branches. Well, these deer fences uh, do work, but they, they have to be maintained and yeah. which is an expensive operation. Make sure you power, because they are electrified. Oh, some of those wires. And if weed comes up or something, or a short, falls on. Uh, right. Shorts it out. Yeah. You've lost a lot of the efficiency of the fence. Now, a particular place, Al Anderson's up there, coming out of Hudson. One morning, I don't know, uh, there was an accident on 9G, so I came back to the, the back road. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, because Al's got a nice, he's a very efficient farmer, and he had this deer fence there. Inside his fence, there's four big buck deer. <laughs> but evidently the power had gone off or something, and they got in there. And then, of course, the problem is getting them out. Because yeah. <laughs> the fence will fence them in as well as the other way. Is this deer fencing like the kind they have over at Montgomery Place, which is tipped? Or what? Uh, That's, one. That's one At an angle. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's fairly effective, though? Uh, uh, quite effective. Uh -huh. But I understand they had quite a little deer damage down there this year, too. They had a lot of deer damage. Yeah. 
Yeah, they think they have a herd of 110. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, they Mandara has that beautiful fence, and I drove by, and there was a huge buck just sitting there inside. It keeps them in as well as it keeps them up. <laughs> I can remember talking about deer now. If we uh, would see a deer out anywhere yeah, in the area, hit. we would Me really too. talk. Gee, I saw a deer Wait, this morning. Top of the conversation. Yeah. Gee, right. Yeah. Yeah. There just weren't deer around this area. Back in the 30s, they were scarce as hen's yeah. teeth. And uh, another, uh, you asked me about uh, being a, a great place to grow apples. Yes, but we have a lot more uh, insects and diseases in the valley than they do in a lot of the other areas because it's such an old apple growing area. And uh, these uh, different uh, insects and that have uh, multiplied and build up the resistance and in this area more so than in the newer uh, apple areas. And of course, uh, every year there's more and more new areas growing apples. Idaho never grew apples until here recently. Now it's becoming one of the major apple growing states. You know, California. Right. They're going to, uh, right now, New York is the third, is it the third? Apple producing state or the second? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, California's going to take that very shortly. And uh, our production has doubled in the United States in the last 10 years. And it's still going on. And don't forget worldwide. Yeah. yeah uh, foreign company, Chile is a big competitor yeah. of ours now. Uh, it's, it's hurting our uh, CA. Uh, uh, Leaf storage. Leaf storage. Leaf storage. Leaf storage. See, now, Shelly is coming in with this, uh, this spring. And, uh, now, come January, February, they're going to be sending in fresh fresh picked uh, apples. Apples, and uh, peaches, pears, whatnot. Uh, Can you ship it, yours there in the fall, which is there in the spring? They don't have any money. No. <laughs> Plus, they, they would come up with all kinds of other excuses that they don't want ours, but yeah, they, they keep uh, sending their stuff in. Uh, in our juice concentrates, that's one of our big problems now. Uh, we are the dumping grounds of the world for uh, food concentrates. France, New Zealand, uh, Australia, Brazil. Brazil. I tried to buy a can of, I had to buy a can of apple concentrate for a recipe. And I tried to buy one that was American. And uh, I couldn't, I mean, except there's one, Grand Union Zone didn't say where it was from. Mm -hmm. and one right. of them had no U.S. Mm -hmm. apples, and one had U.S. in four other countries, I, which startled me. You see, these foreign countries, they subsidize their growers. To produce these apples in, this, in the concentrates. Then they turn around and dump it on our American market here at a much lesser price than what our, our uh, mills over here can uh, process these apples. Right this year, especially, the juice market is way, way down just because there's too much foreign concentrates here in the people. Most people don't realize that. And another thing is, we have to use, uh, or restricted to using certain chemicals. Now, most of these countries, they're using chemicals which we cannot use at a much lesser price. But yet, the American public turn around and buy this stuff and think nothing of it. But yet, they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy it if we could use it, or could use it. Right, Sid? Well, they won't tell us. Can they detect it, or don't they test? I mean, like if somebody else was growing apples somewhere else with Alar and spraying it with, I don't know, DDT. Right, they do. Part of the world. Well, yeah, they test on a, on a, uh, a spot basis, maybe one or two percent of the of the uh, produce is tested, but they can't test it all. And the tests are not current. I mean, by the time we get the tests done, the stuff is long gone into, into, uh, into the channels of uh, consumption, as I understand it. There's so many 
juice drinks on the market now. Is a lot of this being made from the concentrate? Most of, mm. Most of it? But like Snapple and they don't <coughs> that on the... Well, uh, apple juice is used uh, to, to, piece, uh, to dilute and piece out other juices a lot. Yes. Because it's generally even, uh, it's, it's, it's cheaper than most other juices. And uh, frankly, we couldn't, if we had no, Im no, no imported juice, we couldn't, we couldn't supply the demand. There's so much that comes in. But we wish at least that they would be uh, uh, forced to pay our advertising uh, fees <laughs> on, on, on what they send in here. How do you market your apples? Well, usually, usually uh, the, uh, the uh, wholesale is uh, through a broker. Claude does, but I do. Well, well in that's indirectly. Right. That's right. Now, only you there. go through another hand rather than. Well, there yeah. be, you know. Yeah, because our, uh, when I go to New York, I, I see Sid Mead's <laughs> right down there, Snell's uh, with sickle payers and all that down there. And uh, worldwide stuff. I, wish it, I don't know how many of you have ever been down to the Hunts Point Market, but that's another world down there. And I wish you could, all could go down there and see it. It's the world's biggest market. And uh, you never see so much produce in your life. Is it strictly produce? Hmm? Is it strictly produce? Uh, part of it. No, they, 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 you buy almost anything. Meats and stuff there, too? In different sections of it. Oh. Yeah. The main part where we go in that part is primarily fruits and vegetables. Uh, the whole thing, the market there, I think, is 160 acres. On this point, Mark. All uh, enclosed now with guards at the gate. Uh, all on the top is all prison wire, just as if it were a Well, prison. everybody around the market is storming. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you, you, we have to pay to go in, pay a toll to, to go in. Then, uh, if you go out, there's a guard at the gate. You've got to check out with him. And What's the reason for all that security? Well, it had gotten to the point down there. It just wasn't safe to uh, to hardly be in the market. One night before this kind of security came, when it was under the Port of Authority uh, of New York, uh, this one night, uh, this was to Robert T. Coffins, uh, uh, I was unloading, and this truck from New Jersey uh, was parked alongside him, and he brought his uh, girlfriend, wife, or whatnot, with him, and she was sort of sitting in the truck and half dozing off while he was unloading. And she had a, a pocketbook on her lap. First thing you know, she, uh, she realized somebody reached in and grabbed the pocketbook right off her lap there in the truck. And at that time, you could buy most anything you wanted to uh, in the market. There, there was, uh, it was all stolen stuff. It was really rough. Point, but I think it's, it's a wholesale market. Right? It's a wholesale market. So yeah, the world's biggest it's product. In the South Bronx? South Bronx, yeah. Right off Randall Avenue. Mm -hmm. so. so any of the grocery stores around here, you, you can't sell to those grocery stores? Your apples would have to go to a New York uh, and come back out again? Or? Some, some growers uh, do, but uh, all right, they take maybe one or two a bushel a week or something like that, and uh, I, I myself don't have the time to go out and pedal from store to store that way. The, uh, the Rhinebeck IGA bought local apples, and local apples, so the Red Hook IGA, I believe, doesn't anymore. They did for a while. But we don't have the Rhinebeck IGA. That's right. <laughs> right, right. It's going to reopen as a sign. At one time, I did, uh, sell quite a few directly to uh, A&P 
when they had the warehouse up in uh, Colony, and that uh, they would take, that was a, a good outlet. They would take uh, probably 300 uh, boxes a week from me. Uh, but then they closed that warehouse. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, then they, at that time, the next nearest warehouse that was in Springfield. And you know how AMP has sort of faded out of the area. Mm -hmm. So that sort of faded out. And I've never really went into Walbaum, uh, which is another division of AMP, really. Do you have cold storage to hold the apples? Or do you I have do. To but it's not CA, it's regular cold storage. That means I tried, in fact, I'm, I'm sold out right now. I tried, tried to sell out just before uh, Christmas holiday. Is CA the one where the oxygen is controlled? Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you very much. This has been terrific. We have uh, cider, cookies, and an apple. Please take them, because otherwise we have to put them in the refrigerator. Oh, and it's from Hardiman's. It's another. That's a part of the guy from Hardiman's. Can I bring up something? Please. Uh, Ronald Losey. I don't know whether any of you ever knew Losey. Mm -hmm. Ronald Losey. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. His family lived in Upper Red Hook. And he went to school, graduated from Red Hook. His grandfather was a doctor, and his great grandfather was a doctor in Upper Red Hook. Well, Ronald Losey graduated from uh, as a doctor, and he went west. And he ended up in Ennis, Montana, just a little one horse town there. And they uh, offered to uh, set him up in office and build him a build him a small hospital. And he's just written a book about his experiences. This is uh, 50 years ago now, and, his, and uh, he practiced uh, general practice for quite a few years. And he decided he he wanted to be an uh, orthopedic man. And he had done quite a bit of it, but he decided he wanted to go in it and get away from the general practice more. So uh, he did it and uh, kept studying knees. And for some reason or other, he hit on something that uh, uh, the person throws out a knee or something. He can set it back in with, with, uh, without any problem or so forth. Anyway, his his system. Became, uh, uh, he became worldwide known. He just talked to, to uh, the uh, London College of Surgeons. He went to France. He had people come over and study with him, find out how he does it. And now he's written a book. And the book is named Doc. And uh, here it is. Here my wife has got a copy of it. She, she and I are old friends, Ronnie. And we're very interested. But it's a wonderful book. It's, it's, and, we double uh, date it. <laughs> We're trying to uh, to get some interest in and get the darn uh, people in town here to get the book, but they, they won't do it. Well, you farmers are the greatest customers for new knees, anyhow. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> How is he related to John? Is there a John? He was a, uh, John was his uh, cousin. Cousin. Yes. Here's the here's the cover of the book. He was a great friend of my older brother. But he, he, he uh, you know, he was a real old time doctor, and the thing was And he grew up in Rigo. <laughs> 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 Is he still practicing? Well, he's uh, not really practicing. He's kind of a uh, quiet down a little bit. He's probably 75 years old.
copies of it the other day. So what do they do? They order three copies. Uh, if you want to, if you'd like to get it, just go to the bookstore and say, I want Doc. <laughs> Written by Ronald E. Wilson. Dr. Wall. Yes, he had it. The, um, the new bookstore in Hyde Park, that Fiddler's Green, they said they want to, um, one of the things that they're going to carry heavily are books of local interest or related to this. But I haven't been there. Open about a month. Well, anybody reads it is is is, 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 is certainly going to like it. Sure. Thank you. No, I don't really I'm still live there. Yep. No, I want to go to the new old bookstore. Oh, no. I like the old bookstore. Sydney, do it for me. Make car cider by taking the wooden barrel. Well, I called him. Like when I was coming to the library, the lights were on. He was there. So when I called, he said, "Hey, I'm going to take a cider." Yeah, but it, 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 you can't hold it. That way. It doesn't. It doesn't stay the same. It, it tastes different. Well, I mean, it's, it's great when you first do it. You go, oh, boy. Yeah, well, then you have. It. 